All right, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Did Psalm 1 last week, and now uh, Psalm 2 is uh, actually a Christmas psalm. You may not know that. Uh, but as you turn there in your Bibles, be reminded that this is God's Word. Every word of it is inspired by God. It will be addressed by the Holy Spirit as you hear these words. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the day that represents your sons coming into this world, his birth, the Incarnation, the Word made flesh. We pray now as we hear these words that we would hear the grander significance of Him coming, that we would not be numbered among those who would have Your wrath abiding on us, as John's Gospel says, not hidden in Your Son, but we would be numbered among those who trust in Him for that refuge. We pray now that you would show us the utter difference between taking his name in vain, even in this holiday, commercializing, cheapening his name and his coming. And on the other hand, truly honoring him and paying homage and reverencing him. Cause us, Lord, by your Spirit to bow before him now as we hear these words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of this message, and I don't say this for shock value or just to come up with a clever title, but it's literally the contrast at the end of this psalm. And that is, bow or burn. Bow or burn. I mentioned that uh, not many people, uh, if we were to ask not just Christians, but unbelievers, uh, people would recognize that this holiday has been commercialized, it's been cheapened. Um, however, even Christians who would never want to commercialize Jesus, we can all too often still domesticate Jesus. In other words, we can keep him safe and tidy and neat and very non-threatening to all of our constant festivities which have less and less to do with him every day psalm 2 is what we would call a messianic psalm its opening words are uh, introduce us to one who sits at the right hand of the lord it's called here in the hebrew messiah that's sort of the english translation of that uh, in the greek it's christ the name Christ, it's not his last name, it's a royal title. 
It's the Greek version of Messiah. It's a royal term. It's used for kings who are anointed with oil ceremonially, and afterwards the king is simply referred to as the anointed one. In this case, the anointed one of the Lord. The Bible itself calls David the author of this psalm in Acts chapter 4, verse 25. And so if you ask me, is David speaking of himself here or is he speaking of Jesus? My answer is going to be both. It's both. Uh, when he refers to God's anointed, he has himself at the front of his mind. He, he means David most immediately in his historic context. And yet, that passage I just referred to in the book of Acts, that makes it very clear that this is ultimately a song of Jesus. Think about it like this. One of my professors did a sermon, and I think this one was on Psalm 110 or one of the other Messianic Psalms, and he, and he opened off by talking about all these songs that were written back in the day, but these are songs that were remade later on. And unlike some of the other remakes that are butchered the second time, these are those ones, and he listed, and you can have different opinions about this, but these are the ones that were almost written for that second artist. And he, and he used all these historical examples, and I'm like, where's he going with this? And then, and then he went to the Psalms and said, that's what this Psalm is like. It is David singing, um, inspired by the Spirit, and he's speaking about his own historical context. But that song was really written for the one to come. It was Jesus' song. And we have songs about Jesus at Christmas. They still often recognize him as a king in some way. But it's a classic case of taking the Lord's name upon our lips in vain. And so we would not want to be among those people today. And so we're going to look at the psalm and see the undomesticated Christ. First of all, we'll see Christ's enemies in verses 1 through 3. Sort of God's valuation of what the world thinks of Jesus at Christmas. Christ's enemies. Secondly, Christ's inheritance in verses 4 through 9. And then thirdly and finally, Christ's imperative in verses 10 through 12. That's where we're going. Christ's enemies, Christ's inheritance, and then Christ's imperative is the application for us. And here's the big idea. If you get lost at any point, just come back to this. Because God has made all things for his Son, including the wicked, therefore all must either bow or burn. That's the idea of this psalm. Because God has made all things for his son, even the wicked, therefore we must all either bow or burn. Verses 1 through 3 starts by saying, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. These are Christ's enemies. It's the rulers of the earth. What do these earthly powers think of Jesus this Christmas? Well, the Bible says that they rage. The words nations here actually means people groups. It's not like in the modern world where when we think of nations, we think of political boundaries, countries in that sense. It means people groups. All peoples have this heart. All people everywhere have an ingrown hatred of God from birth, Romans 1 tells us in two ways. But it says they are haters of God in Romans 1, 29 and 30. James 4, 4 says that friendship with the world is enmity with God. That means hostility, warfare. This council of nations, no less than the mob at the Tower of Babel in Genesis, is attempting to make a name for themselves, and God's rule is getting in their way. That explains why they react the way they do. They sense that. They sense that it's all about God. And so they say, let us burst their bonds apart, cast away their cords from us. So here, who's there? Who's their bonds and their cords? So it means principally God and his anointed. God and his representative on the earth, God and his king. Kings are in view because David is a king, and he's the one that's immediately speaking. David is the Lord's anointed on earth. He's called the firstborn in Psalm 89, 27, the highest of all the kings on the earth. Now, was David the first king in all the earth? Of course not. 
Firstborn there is a, is a title. That is someone who is special. He's the one that has God's favor. And so what are the other kings of the earth looking at here? They're jealous. They're raging. And as David looks out in this psalm, he sees the evil conspiracy against God's chosen one. And why? What's his explanation? Well, David knows that it's not ultimately about him. They don't care about David and putting him down. It's what David represents. And that tells us that this wicked collective heart of the world is not just working inside of world leaders, but within everyone who gets together with anybody else for any other project that is outside of Christ. But the sense of astonishment that David has as he looks out and he asks the word, why? Why does the world feel this way about God and his anointed? His astonishment is not that people would reject him. It is rather, why would they reject God's perfect king? Again, if you look in the fulfillment passage in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, it also lists world leaders coming together against God's anointed. It says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. So even the people that you would expect to be for Jesus, who say they're for God and his Messiah, the Bible says are assembling themselves against him. See, where our vision of Christmas is of a world that is pausing for a moment to at least pay some tribute to Christ, David doesn't share that vision. David is being led by the Spirit to see through it all to the real heart of the world at Christmas. And it is nothing but unmitigated rage and resistance. Herod was just more honest about it than most people are with his bloodthirsty intentions. But the world is circling like vultures around the baby in the manger. Once they find out that this baby is here not just to be domesticated and kept on Christmas cards, once they find out that it actually doesn't say in the Bible, peace on earth, goodwill to men, but actually says, peace on earth and goodwill to those with whom he is pleased, Luke 2, 14. Once they find out that he's coming for a cross, once, he's coming, once they find out that he's coming to say that you must either bow or burn, then they circle around the Messiah like in Psalm 22, like dogs encircling around the Christ. These bonds and these cords in these verses represent any restraint that comes from God, his sovereign rule, the knowledge of his law, the influence of Christian people. All of these are obstacles to the kingdom of darkness. And so Paul speaks in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, of a mystery of lawlessness that's being restrained for a time. And he adds that only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. The devil is on a very short leash. Everything evil does, it is permitted to do by God who has all power and could stop any of it any moment he wants. Evil deep down inside knows that. All of the minions of hell realize this and they resent it and they lash out against it no earthly ruler wants to think of his own as a puppet government and this is also true of everybody else who's not a king you don't want to feel like your life is being controlled is being laid out for you determined by you that your meaning is not yours to write the own, your own story but it's god's prerogative there is a rebellious desire in each one of us by nature to be liberated from God. And what you're going to see in the first three verses and in going into the fourth is that's actually pretty absurd. It's ridiculous for us to actually think that we can rebel. We're like ants lashing out like almost against a human being except times infinity. And yet for all of this, the very first verse says this is a vain thing. Jesus guaranteed it like this in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And the ultimate statement of this comes again in Acts chapter 4, in that 
fulfillment passage where it refers back to Psalm 2. Right after Peter lists all those co-conspirators, Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles and the Jews, that are all assembling against Christ, and he explains what they did, he adds in verse 28 these words, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. See, Peter, in saying that, understood all of the worst intentions of the enemy as something that was completely moved on the chessboard by God. So God gets the last laugh. And here it is in our second point, Christ's inheritance. It starts by saying, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. God is depicting himself here as one who mocks his enemies. He laughs. He holds them in derision. Now, if you're coming to the Bible, if you're a skeptic or if you're a seeker, or however you might describe yourself, you might look at this and say, that's, that's mean-spirited for God to do that. Well, you might say that if you had sympathy for rogues and tyrants and abusers and the most arrogant people in the world, because that's the picture of these people. God should laugh at them. These rulers are all pretenders. But what is worse for them is that God goes from making fun of them to, it says, terrifying them in his fury. Now, as far as God's resolve to get a real ruler on the throne, we've said that this is about Jesus Christ. And the New Testament is filled with verses that show this, that he is the fulfillment of David's throne. But we see the promise to David all the way back in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13. God says to David, I will raise up from your offspring after you who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now that can't be talking about David if it depended on David's line continuing and there never being someone absent from his throne because we see when they went in captivity, the Jews were asking, where's David? Where are David's sons? Where is the throne? It had to have a fulfillment later on. Now, the words here, Mount Zion or my holy hill, those represent the heavenly Jerusalem or the city of God, the ultimate kingdom. And so we have to see Peter's sermon at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when Jesus rose all the way to heaven. We have to see that as a royal inauguration sermon of the kingdom of Christ breaking into this world. But the throne room itself, the courts of that city of God, is what we would call this mountain or this hill. The reason it's called Mount Zion or my holy hill is because mountains or hills are high. They have a peak. And so the biblical imagery is, and the reason he's talked about in the heavens and so forth is not because he's out there that way really really far in space the imagery is meant to show us something that is high and exalted in the heavens and so who is this speaking of in psalm 2 david or jesus and the answer is both proximately it's david when david looks out he does see kings coming against him they do hate god and that's why they hate him and God is laughing at them, and God is going to establish David on the throne for his real reign a thousand years before Christ. But really, that song was written ultimately for Jesus Christ. Notice the speaker change in verse 7. He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. That's read. Uh, quoted a couple times in the New Testament. It's very clear it's talking about Jesus Christ. But the decree is very, very crucial here. This is what kings do. When kings make a decree, it gets done or else heads roll. But in the case of this decree, this is a divine decree. It gets accomplished. So think of Psalm 33, 10 and 11. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. And so when God tells us, anywhere he tells us, 
about his decree, his intentions, he's telling us the way reality is going to go. He's not just making a prediction. This is a certain decree. And it is that this king of Israel is a son to God. Now, this would not have sounded weird in the ancient world. We need a little description here because we don't have anything like this in our world. We don't have kings. We have democracies. We don't understand this language here. This would not sound bizarre to these readers, though. All kings claimed a divine right to rule. And in order to make this claim, they would see themselves as divine or semi-divine. You see that with Pharaoh or the kings of Persia or anybody else. The king in an ancient kingdom is seen as the son of whether they're gods or a god or whatever, the chief god. And so one way to read this psalm is that David is a son to God, and thus he has the divine right to rule. And that's absolutely true. God does regard him that way. But Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 let us know that this is ultimately Jesus ascending to the throne. Now there's two things that we have to understand in the rest of this psalm. And that's why I gave you all that historical background. It's not just need information. There are two things that belong to the reign and the rule of Christ. And what we're suggesting here is that, you know, we're so focused on gifts in the next 24 hours. One of the things I want to say, kind of a sub-big idea, it's in there is that God created the universe to give as a gift to his son. He created all things, even demons and every skeptic, as a present to his son. But there's two sides to that coin. Two things belong to this reign and rule of Christ. First, God has given all things to his son to be subject to his dominion. That's the plus side. That's the positive. But secondly, before that can happen, God has given all who oppose this kingdom over to his son to be destroyed by the son. Now, I'll give you some New Testament verses for both of these. First, the positive. The psalmist speaks of both all people and all places as a gift from the father to the son. That's verse 8. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, so all the peoples of the earth, and the ends of the earth, your possession, all the places. So New Testament, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Now that's not necessarily negative, sounds great. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. He says in John three thirty five that the Father loves the Son, and has given all things into his hand. Now this says more than simply that all the elect have been given to the Son. We saw that a couple weeks ago in John 6. That's true in a very special saving way. All things will be restored in the work of Jesus, in the gospel. And so he says in the end in Revelation 21.5, and he says this from his throne, Behold, I am making all things new. So the new creation is given to the Son in a special way, and this is all good news. But we also need to know that all things in the old creation were also given to the Son for a very different reason. Add this to your conception of Christmas. It won't make you popular, but it's biblical truth. He adds these words to the promise. Remember the promise of a present from the Father to the Son in verse 9. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now stop there. If I'm listening to this and I say, okay, so you say that the meaning of Christmas is that God created all of reality to give as a present to his son, to make him king and lord over all things. Sounds good. Next words, you shall break it all with a rod of iron and dash it to pieces like a potter's vessel. I'm very confused at this point. Is that a mistake? Now the rod here is held by a shepherd. But somewhere along the line in the ancient world, they came up with this phrase, a rod of iron. It became a symbol by which monarchs, who would normally deal gently with their flock, they were seen as a shepherd. 
instead had to drive them by force. Now, when earthly monarchs did that, that was almost always abusive. That was almost always a show of strength. It was sinful. But not so with this king. He would have ruled them gently with a shepherd's rod. But he says even to his own people in Matthew 23, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. And so because of this, because of the evil, because of the way people have reacted to the real king, there's this other side of God giving all things to his son. In John 5, and 23, he says it in a different way. For the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. So consider that as people stare into manger scenes, as if simply bowing, or much less looking, is honoring the Son. When Jesus says in John 5 that the Father has given all judgment to the Son, he will judge the world, he will break the nations, the peoples, with a rod of iron, so that all may honor the Son. The judgment of Christ is driven toward honoring the Son. Now, it is also true that Jesus says in John 3 that the Father did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. But there he is speaking of being sent into the world, namely the first time, his first advent, coming in the form of humility and lowliness and announcing judgment and mercy, and in other words, giving a chance between his first coming and his second coming. But in his second coming, this king comes in an exalted form, a final form, now executing that judgment and mercy. And this is certainly a different picture of the Son of God that is often portrayed on Christmas cards. In the end, King Jesus is coming back to destroy the nations. As Paul put it in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And so to repeat, God made everything for his son. Yes, even the wicked for the day of trouble, as Proverbs 16, 4 says. But if all of that is true, what does that demand of us? There's an all-important takeaway from Christ's enemies being the very heart of the world and Christ's inheritance being all things in the world to judge and to save, then there's Christ's imperative. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now he speaks first to the very top of the world's hierarchy, to rulers. But not as some getaway for us, like, oh, he's just talking about the head honchos. Not to put the rest of the people in the nations at ease, because he just said he's going to crush the whole nations. 
The reason he aims at the top of the hierarchy, at the rulers of the earth, is to show that all are under this warning, that none are exempt. And so if the highest people with the greatest power are not exempt from this judgment, if they cannot escape, much less can all who are less than them escape. And what is being commanded here is true worship. Serve the Lord with fear. You you see this balance of true worship, not just worship, but true worship. Rejoice with trembling. Take your delight in God and fear God, both the true God as he really is. And that tells us that all human beings owe God right worship. And therefore, all human beings owe Jesus Christ right worship. The wise men that came to Jesus were not doing Jesus any favors by bringing those gifts. They were under orders. The same orders that we're under. And the next words remind us of what they brought and what they did. They bowed and they brought gifts, but how so? And the most important thing about this is not, was there three wise men? It doesn't say three. And and where did they come from? And all those things. And it's very interesting. But the most important thing about them is what it means that they were bowing and bringing gifts. It says, kiss the sun in the ESV. And, um, and, and it really is kiss. It comes from the Hebrew root, um, nashach, which is to kiss. It's not simply, and, and I think the other translations, the reason that they went with to pay homage or do homage, and that's right, because they wanted to, I guess, paint the picture that um, this is not um, any other kind of kiss, nor is it even a simple friendly kiss. But it is what people would do in the ancient world when they would come into the king's court and they would bow and they would usually bring gifts and pay tribute and they would kiss the royal signet ring. And so there was an ultimate tribute being paid to the monarch. Now, this psalm ends with a contrast here. Just as we saw in the first psalm, there, there there was two roads and there was at the end blessing and cursing. There was a judgment and there was blessing. And in this case, it's wrath versus blessing. He first gives us the consequences of failing to bow and pay tribute to the son. And the first consequence is he will be angry. Who will be angry? Will will the father be angry, but Christ, he will be angry for Jesus because Jesus is lowly, meek, and mild? No, this is what Revelation calls the wrath of the lamb. He, Christ, will be angry. The Son will be angry, not only the Father. And then secondly, Christ is depicted as one who will exact vengeance on all those who dishonor him. Revelation uses the imagery of people hiding, not even wanting to look, hiding themselves under a rock, looking for a rock to crush them. Please give me a giant rock to crush me so that I can escape the look, the gaze of the wrath of the Lamb. That's a different picture of Jesus than many have. To any traitors, to anyone who does not trust in in Jesus, and we'll see in a second what it really means to honor him, he warns that you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. The sun has wrath. It's quickly kindled. This wrath is depicted as being on the move so that there's a way and there are those who have the audacity to stand in this way when they should be bowing in this way. And they are imagined as if they are in the way of a fire. As God's wrath is compared in the scriptures to a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries in Hebrews 10, 27. And then a couple of verses down in Hebrews 10, he says that our God is a consuming fire. That this is one of his attributes. That this belongs to him appropriately. And I think sometimes in our domestication of Jesus and our commercialization of Christmas, I think we can fall into this. In fact, I just saw yesterday a Christmas special, a product It was a Christmas hoodie. 
or at least a Christian hoodie with the words on the front, Jesus loves you, from, uh, sort of top to down. But right above loves was the word judges, except that was crossed out, this, this red line that went through judges so that what was left was simply Jesus loves you. Well, let me tell you, if that red line did not represent the blood of Jesus and what he said he did for us, then that would be a lying slogan. That would be a false gospel. If we are not bowing the knee to this ultimate reason for Jesus' coming, then we are not honoring him at all. Well, then the psalm ends in verse 12 with the other side of the contrast. As if to say, but blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, the more you dig into those words that came before it, the more you would hope that it would say more than just this one half of a sentence. He's coming with fire. I warn you, he's coming, bow down. And so, and then all that, and all it says is blessed are all who take refuge in him. Refuge from what? Well, from the fire that he himself is. Now, this is where the psalm might be too short for us, but it's not. The New Testament spares no details. We know from the scriptures that this fire of divine vengeance is poured out on all sin. Nahum 1.3 says that he will by no means clear the guilty. All sin, in other words, must be punished by a holy God. If he is truly good and just, then he must deal with sin. But the Bible also says that many will have their sins atoned for in exactly this way. By being placed in Christ as in a refuge, as this psalm ends. Or, in other words, in a shelter in a hiding place, so that Jesus is our hiding place in a very specific way. The place is the cross of Jesus, where this divine fire fell on the sun instead of on those who are hiding in him. Now, to all those who are not hiding in him, that fire still awaits, that fire still burns, as John 3, 36 says, that for those who do not trust in the Son. The wrath of God abides on them. That means it, it lives on them. It's following them around. It is waiting for them. It remains on them. But not so for those who are hiding in him. This is the center. This is the gospel. This is the reason for him coming. The embers of the flames that were dramatized again and again in the Old Testament in that sacrifice that was insufficient, that eventually burned out, the burnt offering. Those whole sacrificial animals were consumed. And those worshipers, even though they looked forward to Jesus instead of looking back to him, they were hiding in the shelter of the tabernacle. They were as profane and as wicked as the pagan kings that are under warning by this psalm. But they were there under the shelter of the tabernacle that symbolized Christ to come. And therefore, because they trusted in God for that promise, though they may not have understood it, they were under this blessing. They had their sins atoned. So how can this wrath and this blessing go together? How can this psalm end the way that it does? How can such a fire be aimed at every single person in the world and such a short, short word of blessing at the end give us any comfort at all? Well, we have to look into that fire and look into that refuge. Fire can be a thing of comfort. You ever sit by a fire? I've done this many times. You sit by a fire on a cool night, and it gives you warmth. But have you ever looked deeper and just sat next to somebody and you just let your thoughts go? It happened many, many times to me. You stare into the very center, into the very hottest coals, at those things that are being consumed. And I've sat next to many people, some of them unbelievers, 
who at that moment begin to speak of what they know deep down inside is real. And you contemplate hell. The fire that they know deep down inside is real and is waiting for them. And I think this is where Jonathan Edwards was so profound as he looked around the world and he saw what he called images of divine things. In other words, things in nature that God has made the way that they are to remind us of something in God or something that God is doing. Images of divine things. And, and here the psalmist holds out fire as such a symbol. Fire is both the great danger that the Son is, that He is the great danger, depending on how we've reacted to Him. And yet that same Son, who is this fire, is the one that we must take refuge in. That we are saved from God, by God. We are saved by God. But we are saved from God. Now, I am certainly no expert on fire. But one of the things that has interested me really for 20 years, because there's always been these, these very famous, in the news, large wildfires. We've had some recently in California and elsewhere, even this year, in our recent history. And I've been very interested to hear about how the firefighters often contain the blaze and how they sometimes keep themselves safe. Images of divine things. Sometimes they use this method called backburning, and if you're not familiar with that, there's sort of a controlled area where they actually intentionally burn. And the purpose of them doing that is to sort of form a, a line of unflammable, if that's the right word, um, where it's already burned, where it's already fallen, and therefore the flames don't have any fuel left to burn. So they sort of, they sort of stop it there at this wall. Because there, the fire is already consumed all that it can consume, all that it's meant to consume. And so the fire has already fallen there, and so it can't fall again. And now one of the interesting ways that firefighters uh, protect themselves is to use these massive heat shields, and if you look at them, they kind of look like tinfoil. It's sort of a last resort, but they have to fall to the ground and let these things cover them so that the fire can pass over them and they can stay safe. And so it is that they take refuge in this shield, bowing to the ground in a place that the fire has already fallen and therefore can't burn anymore. Now, bowing down by itself is no shelter in this fire. There's kindling below you. You yourself are flammable, and especially when we're talking about this kind of a divine fire. Because in God's courtroom, if we were outside of Christ, if we did not trust in Jesus, there is nothing more flammable in all the world than all of the treason that we have in our own hearts and our own hands. And so the true honor that is given to the Son takes refuge in Him, as this psalm says. They accept his cross as this shield and fortress in the flames. It confesses with David in 2 Samuel 22, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. This is why the one who is, was given as a son into the world is the rock of ages. It's not because he is a good moral teacher alone. It is not because he's just someone to follow as if we could follow his example. It is that he is a savior and a deliverer from his own fire. It's because he came to die in place of those who he is warning right here. It is on the cross that he became that rock of refuge for us. And the greatest danger of all fell on him and provided a place for us to bow down like the wisest of all wise men, where he took the fire in our place. It is there, and only there, at that cross, at that place, that we truly pay homage to this king. And so this very kind warning is for everyone here today. That when this universe is rolled away like a scroll, 
and its elements are burned by fire. And there is nothing left in between you and your holy maker. The only place of safety will be to bow down and take refuge in that place where the fire has already fallen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you sent your son for such a love as this. That you would be glorified in him in giving him all things. And that you would redeem a people by pouring out your wrath that all of us deserve. But that because of your great love and your mercy, you have provided a refuge for all of us to hide in the King. We pray now that we would not trivialize this holiday, nor any other Sunday, or any time we open the Bible or say that we are Christians, but that we would pay homage to this King by bowing, by confessing in this great salvation. Be glorified in our worship now and our fellowship this holiday together as families as a church family. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand? You can pass the plate around. You can pass the thing around now.